This morning is our final sermon in our series, Psalm of Ascent, The Journey of Dependence. I'm kind of a little sad about that. Uh, it's been a, been a really special uh, three months, 14 weeks, that uh, we've been going through this series of psalms. And uh, I hope God has used that in your life. I hope he's used it to, uh, to bring you to a, more of a place of dependence with him and uh, as we've been following the Israelites uh, on their journey to Jerusalem. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Psalm 134 this morning. There's a short little psalm that concludes the Psalms of Ascent. As I said a moment ago, uh, Psalm 134 reflects that the pilgrimage for the people of Israel has come to an end. The journey from where they started has brought them to their final destination. And the final destination we all know is Jerusalem. They were coming to God's temple for one of the worship festivals to worship him. And as they enter God's temple, all the songs that they have sung along the journey have prepared them for this time of worship with God's people together as a nation. I love that little model there of the temple. That's possibly a, an artist's rendition of what the temple would have looked like as the people of God were journeying to Jerusalem and as they gathered together for worship. This morning as we uh, look at this short little psalm, I, I want us to notice what the psalmist is going to say about worship in God's temple. Notice the few things that the psalmist says. Let's go ahead and stand together. As I said, this is not only the last psalm in the Psalm of Ascents, but it's the shortest. <laughs> Just a few verses. The psalmist uh, says in Psalm 134, Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night, in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. Would you pray with me? God, thank you again that we could be together uh, this morning. Uh, I just pray for our time together as, as we look at this short psalm and we talk about this idea of worshiping you Lord, I, I pray that you would speak to each one of us. God, you, you know the challenges that we're facing in our life today, and uh, you know the things that we're dealing with, Lord, so we just pray that you would open our eyes and soften our heart to hear from you, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So as I said a moment ago, the journey has now brought the Israelites to the temple, and Psalm 134, scholars say, is a liturgical song. This is actually a song that they would sing in the courts of the Lord, in the temple. It's a song that calls upon the worship leaders to lead the people of God in worship. It's also a song that pronounces God's blessing on worshipers on the people that worship God. As we bring this series to a close, God is still calling people to worship him. Amen? Amen. Today, in the world we live in, God still desires an audience of worshipers. And you know, people can either respond to that call or they can reject it. And there are consequences for either whether we respond to God's call or whether we reject it. And we're going to look at that a little bit today. We're also going to look at what does it mean biblically to worship the Lord. There are two basic points that the psalmist highlights in his psalm. The first one is this. It's also on your outline. Number one, servants of the Lord should worship God with all their strength. Servants of the Lord 
should, should worship God with their voices, with their hands, with all of who they are. We should worship the Lord. The psalmist says in, in verse 1, the psalmist says, praise the Lord. In the Hebrew, this is a phrase that is very familiar to all of us. Alleluia, right? There's a popular uh, pop song on the radio these days that says Alleluia, kind of interesting. <laughs> I wonder if they know what it actually means, right? Alleluia, we've talked about Yah or Yahweh, which is the personal name of God. It's a very sacred, holy name. As a matter of fact, it's so holy that scholars tell us that the Israelites would rarely even utter it from their mouths. It was so sacred to them that they, they did, wouldn't even say it out of reverence for God. Alleluia. Praise the Lord. The psalmist says, praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. Praise Yahweh, all you servants of Yahweh, who minister by night in the house of Yahweh. Now, who were those who ministered in the temple? It was the priests, right? And the Levites. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, we see that God called the tribe of Levi to minister in the tabernacle and later in the temple. Look up on the PowerPoint there, Deuteronomy 10.8. Moses says, at that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister, and to pronounce blessings in his name as they still do today. Wow. What a high calling that God had on this tribe, the tribe of Levi. They, they had the responsibility of transporting the tabernacle, transporting the Ark of the Covenant, the footstool of the Lord, and to pronounce blessings on the Lord. Later in 1 Chronicles, we get a little bit more detailed description of what the Levites did. It says, the duty of the Levites was to help Aaron's descendants in the service of the temple of the Lord to be in charge of the courtyards, the side rooms, the purification of all sacred things, and the performance of other duties at the house of God. They were in charge of the bread set out on the table, the flour for the grain offerings, the unleavened wafers, the baking and the mixing, and all measurements of quantity and size. Catch this. They were also to stand every morning to thank and praise the Lord. They would do the same in the evening. Wow. <laughs> Those are some important responsibilities they had, right? They, their job as servants was to prepare the temple for worship. They were also musicians and, and instrumentalists. And they had the responsibility as worship leaders to lead the Israelites into God's presence, to worship the Lord. And they had this responsibility both in the morning and in the evening. In the temple, in the tabernacle, and then the temple, it was very important that Yahweh would be worshiped all day. Later in, in First Chronicles, uh, we see that there were rooms actually in the temple that the Levites would, would stay there during their, their time of service so that they would be ready when they were called upon to worship the Lord, to lead God's people in worship. If you're curious where that's at, it's First Chronicles 9.33. In verse 2 of Psalm 134, the psalmist says, Lift up your hands 
in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. There it is again, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Psalmist says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary, right? Now, the sanctuary could have been the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, but more likely, he's talking about the temple as a whole, right? Because later on, David in Psalm 28.2 says, hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift up my hands towards your most holy place. So we see that David also worshiped the Lord in the sanctuary. Now, David wasn't a priest, so he couldn't go into the Holy of Holies. David lifted up his hands and worshiped the Lord. One of the things that we see about the Jewish culture is that there are people that use physical expression to worship God. Throughout the Bible, you'll, you'll see stories of the Israelites dancing before the Lord in worship. Wow. <laughs> Boy, what would that be like if, if us Baptists were dancing before the Lord? Boy, that would be pretty crazy, wouldn't it? But we see verses of, of Israelites raising their hands in worship before the Lord. In other places, we see them prostrate on the ground with their face to the ground before the Lord in reverence to God. They were a people that used physical expression to worship God. And the Levites in the temple were, were no different. They were raising their hand in worship to Yahweh. Now today, in the, under the new covenant, who are the Levites in the church? Anybody? We all are. Yes. We all are. We have wonderful worship leaders who lead us in worship, but we are all Levites. We all have the responsibility of worshiping the Lord. Remember last week we looked at 1 Peter chapter 2? You remember what Peter talked about? He said, we are all a part of the priesthood of believers. If you believe in Jesus Christ for salvation, you are part of the priesthood of believers. And you know, we don't have to get on a plane and travel to Jerusalem. Boy, that would be nice if we could. But you know what? If we went to Jerusalem, guess what? The temple's not there. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says that the people of God are the temple of God. You know that when we gather together as the people of God in humility and reverence, the Spirit of God is with us and we are the temple of God? Listen to what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 3.16, he says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? He was talking to the Corinthian church, telling them, you are God's temple. You don't need to go to Jerusalem anymore. All you need to do is gather together with, with humility and reverence and worship the Lord. And as believers, as the priesthood of believers who are God's temple, we are to offer spiritual sacrifices to God. Remember 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we read last week? Let's read it together. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We're a priesthood. We're a holy nation, a people belonging to God. 
that offer spiritual sacrifices to God. You know, in, in my many years of ministry, there have been times that I've talked to people and they would say, you know, I don't really care for that part of the service where we do the worship thing. I'm more into the message. I, I don't really like the music. Uh, you know, I, I, that's not really my thing. I really like the message. And you know, when they say that, in my thought, I'm saying, whoa. Do you know what you're saying? Boy, I hope God didn't hear that. Oh, oops, he did. <laughs> right? Boy, when we say that we don't like worship, that we don't value worship, we need a value realignment. Because we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that we may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Well, one of our main responsibilities, something that we will be doing for eternity, catch that one more time, something that we will be doing for eternity is we will be worshipers of God. Psalm 98, four through five, says make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of a psalm, with trumpets and sound of a cornet. Boy, I don't even know what a cornet is. It's a trumpet, okay. With trumpets and the sound of a cornet, make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Later in Colossians, Paul would say to the Colossian believers, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. As you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Riviera, as believers, we need to see that our vocation is to be worshipers of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what we're called to. And we're called to worship him with, with loud, celebratory psalms and songs. We're called to worship him with quiet, reverent songs. We're called to worship him with the harp. Boy, that would be cool, wouldn't it? If had a harpist up here. We're called to worship him with the harp, with trumpets, guitars, whatever we can. We're called to raise our hands in worship if you feel led. We're called to bow our knee before the Lord and be prostrate before the Lord in reverence. We are called to worship the Lord. But you know what the good thing about worshiping the Lord is? Is there is blessing in worshiping God. That's the second point this morning. Servants of the Lord experience blessing through worship. Falling into our God-ordained role as worshipers leads to blessing. Look what the psalmist says there in verse three. The psalmist says, may the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. The psalmist prays a, a benediction over the servants in the temple. Again, this was a liturgical psalm. Remember, this was something they sang in the temple. As worshipers of the one true God, he's asking God to do for his people what God said he would already do. You said, well, where's that? 
Remember Psalm 125, one through two? Earlier in our study, the psalmist said, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. Wow. When we put our trust in the Lord, when we choose to worship him, God surrounds us. He protects us in the same way that the mountains surrounded Jerusalem. When we choose to worship the Lord, this blessing is played out in our lives, this benediction. From the very beginning of creation, we see that man was called to worship the Lord. Do you agree? Adam and Eve in the garden were completely dependent on God for everything. And so I believe it was very natural from Adam and Eve to, to have that posture of worship to God, to be thankful for his provisions. But I'll tell you what, when they chose to rebel against God, everything changed. When they chose to partake of that forbidden fruit, and they chose self-dependency over God-dependency, everything changed. Their descendants after them, which includes us, we come into the world not with a posture of humble reverence for God. We come into the world with a posture of rebellion. We tell God, I'm not going to worship you. I'm not going to bow my knee before you. I'm going to worship myself. I'm going to worship knowledge. I'm going to worship money. I'm going to worship power. In the beginning of, of his book to the Romans, Paul talks about what sin has done to mankind in Romans chapter 1. Look what Paul says there, verse 21. He says, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Who's Paul talking about? He's talking about mankind. He's talking about all of us. Though we knew God, we still chose to not glorify him as God. In our sinful nature, in our pre-redemptive state, we choose to not thank God for anything. We choose to not give him honor and glory. And our thinking became futile and our foolish hearts were darkened. Paul goes on in, in verse 22 to talk about the, the consequence of choosing to not worship God. He says, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. In our pre-redemptive state, we're idolaters. We're self-dependent rather than God-dependent. We, we choose to worship created things rather than the creator. And at the end of chapter one, Paul talks about the consequences for rejecting God. And boy, it's not pretty if you look at it. It's all the, the selfish, 
insolent acts that human beings can do to each other in the degrading of their bodies. In the beginning of, of chapter 2, Paul says very clearly, he says that God is righteous and just in condemning sinners. He basically says God has to condemn sin. And later in chapter 2, he talks about because of that, that's where the law comes in, right? Natural religion. Man, man sees that, that he or she is a sinner. And when we see that we're a sinner, our conscience convicts us. And we say, boy, i got to do something about that. i got to try to make things right. And we set out in our own efforts to try to become righteous. But Paul says in the beginning of chapter 3 of Romans, he says it doesn't work. Because all of our efforts to become righteous are like filthy rags before the Lord. Why? Because God's standard is perfection. And, and we don't have the ability in ourselves to keep the law. But there is one who does. And that's the good news. Romans 3, 23, Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. We're all very familiar with that verse. We know that we've all sinned We've all fallen short of the glory of God. None of us has the ability in ourselves to live up to God's glory, right? To, to live up to that perfect standard. And because of that, Paul says in, in Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. But that's not the end of the story. The, the good news is, is that God in his grace has sent his son Jesus Christ to justify us to die on the cross for our sins so that through that redemption we might be saved. We might be forgiven. And you know the only response to receiving that in, in our lives to recognizing what Christ has done for us is to worship him, to praise him. And that's exactly what Paul does. Later on, he, he quotes David in Psalm 32. Look at what he says. Paul says, blessed are they whose sins are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. The only response to receiving God's work of redemption in us is to worship him to exalt him. We choose to worship God because our sins are forgiven. We choose to worship God because we are delivered from the life that Paul talks about, right, in the end of chapter one. We choose to worship God because we will spend eternity with him. God has saved us from hell. Man, that news should get us dancing in the aisles. That should be something that gets you excited. And the benediction, the blessing that the psalmist in Psalm 134 prays over the Levites is fulfilled through us. Do you see that? Psalm 134 is really a prophecy about us and God's blessing on our lives. This morning, here's, here's what I'd like you to, to take away from this psalm and, and, and really what I'd like you to take away from this sermon series, the Psalms of Ascent. We are called to be worshipers of God. 
That is our vocation. As I said earlier, there's really only a few things that we're going to be doing for eternity. I hope one of them is golf. No, just kidding. Some of you like guns out there. Don's hoping we'll still be shooting in heaven. There's only a few things that we're going to be doing in heaven, right? And one of them is worshiping God. Bowing at the feet of the throne of our Lord and exalting him, glorifying him. Maybe you're here today and and maybe you've never made that decision before. As I look around, I don't see really anybody. Most of us here are believers. But maybe there is somebody here today who's never chosen to bow their knee before the Lord. Who's never chosen to be a part of that choir of worshipers. Friend, if that's who you are today, I want to encourage you to surrender to the Lord. Because you will not experience blessing in your life until you choose to place Jesus Christ on the throne of your life. Until you choose to worship him. Or maybe you're here today and and maybe at one point You were a worshiper of the Lord. But lately, you have decided, maybe because of anger, to not worship him. Maybe your frustration with life has has gotten you to a point where you've hardened your heart and you're not bowing your knee before the Lord. Maybe you're worshiping something else other than God. Friend, if that's where you're at, I want to encourage you to acknowledge that this morning. I want to encourage you to confess that anger to the Lord, that frustration. Jesus has come that you may have life and life more abundantly, and you will not experience that abundant life until you are in that place of worshiping God. And so if for some reason you are not worshiping God and you're worshiping something else, I want to encourage you today to acknowledge that, to confess that. And I want to encourage you to ask God to forgive you and make a choice today to get back into that role of being a worshiper of the Lord. Mm -hmm.